As the battle over spending and debt continues, an even tougher battle is being waged over how to cut popular entitlement programs like Social Security. My next guest has a very novel solution. Take a look at this map. The federal government owns nearly 650 million acres of land. All the yellow that you see is what they own. They practically own the entire western portion of the United States of America. Professor Walter Williams says, give me land and you can keep your entitlements. George Mason, Mason economics professor Walter Williams joins me now. Professor Williams, it's a pleasure. Welcome back to Freedom Watch. Good day, good day. Uh, this is a great suggestion. How would this work? I mean, you sort of blurted it out the other day on the radio, and now everybody's talking about it. Well, well look, I think that people who have paid into Social Security, they, they're do something. And the people who make the argument, look, I worked uh, 30, 40 years, and I paid into Social Security. But however, the, what the money that they pay into Social Security for their retirement, the government has spent. And the only way that they can receive a retirement check is for the government to take money from somebody in the workforce. Now, here's what I say about that. I say, look, as far as I'm concerned, what the government can do is that it has a lot of wasting assets, as you pointed out. Uh, in, in they, that is, in, in Alaska, they own something like 70% of the land. In Nevada, 85% of the land. And that's a wasting asset. So here's my deal to Congress. Give me 100 acres in Alaska or Oregon or Nevada, and you can keep all that I, uh, all that you plan to give me in, in the form of Social Security uh, uh, receipts. Now, now, this is not a crazy suggestion. I mean, you are not only an economist, no. you're a historian. You know that before Lincoln's illegal income tax, the government, and even after the income tax was declared illegal, financed itself by selling a lot of uh, real estate that it owned. So why can't the government sell that, that, that land is, or give it away? Th that is absolutely right. And if you look at the West Coast, I don't see your map, but if you look at the west, western part of the United States, right. the government owns a whole lot of land. Or in the East, they don't own any more than, let's say, 1 or 2% of the land of Pennsylvania or Connecticut or New York, They whereby they own 90% of the land in Nevada. And so I think that these are wasting assets and the government needs to get rid of them, and one way to get rid of them and just make a one-time uh, reduction in the in the federal obligation is just give people who owe who are owed Social Security uh, receipts just to give them land and say, hey, right, do what you want with All them. All right, I, I share your views. The people that have contributed to Social Security have a contract with the government to get that money back with interest. They've been giving it to the government for all their working lives. But I think you and I also share the view that Social Security is unconstitutional, that the federal government has no authority to take money from A and give it to B. What would be, Professor Williams, a long-term solution that would be economically sound and constitutionally sound to the Social Security mess? <laughs> well, I, I think that government ought to get out of the business of take, forcing people to, be, uh, to prepare for their retirement. I mean, it, it should be offensive to the idea of liberty for for the government, to, for Congress to be able to say to me, look, each week I demand that you put such and such aside for your retirement. Suppose they did the same thing with housing or forced me to put a certain amount of, for food or my kids' tuition. We would all deem that tyranny. And it's just as tyrannical to force you and I to put a certain aside, or put a certain side of a, a amount of our salary aside for Social Security. And, and, and of course, we I think, know... I think Congress... Go ahead, Professor. I, and let, me, let me say this. I think most of our problems in our country are a result of Congress involved in taking what belongs to one American and giving it to another American to whom it does not belong, and that's two-thirds of the federal budget. It's right. nothing more than legalized theft. And we know that when people find out that Congress is there to, to cut up a big piece of the pie, they will send to Washington only those who promise to return home with as big a piece of the pie as, it, as they can. Professor Williams, it's a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Judge. Democrats and Republicans in Congress reached a monumental, historic, and ridiculous agreement over the 2011 budget. They extended funding for the government by a whopping two weeks. But did they simply just kick the can down the road? Next.
Senate joining the House today and voting for a two-week band-aid to keep the government running until St. Patrick's Day. Great. Two more weeks for spending money we don't have. Two more weeks to play politics. Two more weeks without serious debate. Add in Secretary of Defense Robert Gates warning us that the Defense Department faces a crisis if the Republicans get their way on spending cuts. My next guest has news for Secretary Gates. We're in crisis mode already. Joining me now is Arizona Congressman, and maybe soon Arizona Senator, Jeff Flake. Congressman Flake, it's a pleasure. Welcome here. Thanks for having me on, Judge. Can we cut the uh, Defense Department budget and cut across the board, as Senator Paul uh, has advocated and as some of your colleagues have advocated as well? Or is the Defense Department, with its $900 billion budget and its 900 missions around the world, a sacred cow? I think we're going to have to cut across the board. Uh, there, there's no way we can get uh, handle, a handle on this deficit and this debt without looking at everything. And uh, Secretary Gates has identified, I think, $87 billion over five years. Uh, we've got to go deeper than that. You uh, voted uh, earlier this week for the two-week extension, the so-called continuing resolution right. that lets the president spend and the government stay in business for two more weeks. What, what was the purpose of that? Why? Why delay the inevitable? At some point, there has to be a real debate and real cutting. Why just kick the can down the road? Well, it's a two-week CR. I, I didn't vote for the uh, the other CR. I thought that we should have uh, cut the hundred billion that we said we were going to cut. Right. But uh, we'll we'll give them two weeks, and then uh, we'll come back. But we've got to quit kicking the can down the road, like you said, and uh, and get to some real cuts. Uh, we're we're. We're dinking around with, uh, you know, uh, even if we would have cut $100 billion out of discretionary spending, that represents about one-fifteenth of all discretionary spending. Right, right. And, uh, well, I'm sorry, one-fifteenth of the current deficit. And we've got to get into entitlements, and, and to do that, we've got to get to the FY12 budget. And as long as we're playing around with CRs, uh, we're, we're putting off the inevitable, uh, which means uh, real serious uh, reform of entitlement right. programs. What, what will uh, you, Congressman Jeff Blake, and other fiscal conservatives and libertarians in the House do. If the House Republican leadership creates some sort of a compromise with Harry Reid and the Senate and the President, which does not cut the hundred billion, which does not even cut the sixty billion, which does not support a balanced budget amendment, which doesn't make any of the meaningful material cuts that you have advocated, will you vote to raise the debt ceiling or will you go along with leadership? Well, the debt, we have kind of two, two different things here. We have the CR uh, for FY11, right. which uh, goes through the end of September. Uh, that, that's, that's really a small game. As you mentioned, the debt ceiling is a real, uh, that's where we have real leverage. And that's where we've got to have uh, significant cuts and serious uh, budget caps, where you have a rescission that comes in if we fail to uh, cut like we have to do. And, and I, I think only if you have that, are, are we going to fix this situation? Because members of Congress have simply been unable uh, to make the cuts necessary to deal with our debt and deficit. So I think the best you can do is have caps, serious caps, Graham Rudman Holling type caps, which, which require a rescission or across the board cut if we fail to meet the spending targets. Got it. Uh, Congressman Flake, it's a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for doing what you're doing. And now a few items from our Freedom File. The government assault on the First Amendment continues. Julian P. Heckline, a former Penn State University chemistry professor, believes jurors should vote their consciences when they determine a verdict, and not just go by the laws that are on the books. And to get his message out, he handed out pamphlets to people outside of a federal courthouse in New York City. This is the oldest means of advancing an idea and an opinion in America, handing out pamphlets. This act is protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Yet the professor has been indicted for jury tampering. The charge is a farce. He has not targeted any specific jurors over any specific case. Clearly, the government fears the professor, because if jurors vote their consciences, then many unjust government laws may be harder to enforce. The government is bent on silencing him. That would be the same government that swore an oath to protect his freedom. But the assault on free speech is not limited just to handing out pamphlets. Under new regulations in the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act of 2010, if you're a financial advisor, you can only give $150 in political campaign contributions to state and local governments, even though federal and state laws permit contributions many times that amount. Under this new federal law, 
if you want to give more or even volunteer, you have to get permission from the government to do so. Excuse me? Permission from the government to speak? Campaign contributions and volunteering are expressions of speech. Where have we come? When a financial reform bill is stripping financial advisors of their constitutional and natural right to speech, we have arrived at the doorstep of a government that hates and fears freedom. However, there was a huge victory today for free speech across the board. The Westboro Baptist Church is a group of some of the most vile and evil people in the country. They protest military funerals because in their perverse opinion, the United States tolerates homosexuality. And so God is punishing America by killing members of the military. It's demented and sick, but it is their right, both natural and constitutional, to believe this and to say it even while protesting a funeral of a fallen soldier. Today, the Supreme Court of the United States affirmed this right to freedom of speech by rejecting a lawsuit filed against the church. In its 8 to 1 ruling, the court has acknowledged that the Constitution protects all political speech, no matter how absurd or hateful, and the government may not punish speech that it hates or fears. Coming up, syndicated columnist Eric Margolis has dined with the murderous dictator of...